Welcome to Music Crush, a new music podcast hosted by Flute New Music Consortium. I'm Elizabeth Robinson. And I'm Nicole Reiner. And announcing FNMC Presents, an album of previous commissions and competition winners performed by members of the Flute New Music Consortium. Repertoire includes works by Sean O'Pevolo, Joseph Hallman, Becca Sims, Sharice Slider, and others. Purchase a copy today. All proceeds go directly to FNMC. Flute New Music Consortium, Inc. is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Your contributions are tax deductible to the extent allowed by the law. Visit www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com for details. Flutist and pedagogue Erica Boyson is a leading innovator within interdisciplinary performance, particularly known for her uniquely evocative collaborations, including movement, singing, and acting. Boyson uses these forms of creative expression both in performance and as a method for teaching artistic concepts. She currently holds the position of Associate Professor of Flute, congratulations, at University of North Carolina in Greensboro, and her degrees are from University of Michigan, New England Conservatory, and University of North Carolina School of the Arts. Erica, welcome to Music Crush. woo It's good to be here! Thank you for the invitation to join you all. Absolutely. Uh, first off, can you tell us about your video mobile app, Moving Sound? It sounds mm. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. A, a project that literally took, I think, around like four years to wow to um, put out into the world. So the, the, this, the story behind or the genesis of this app began when I, I came here to Greensboro, which was fall of 2015. I went to a, a party. A colleague of mine was saying, we're gathering at a friend's house. You should come over. And I was like, yes, I, I'm excited to meet new people. So I go over and one of my colleagues gives me their recent album. And it was in this beautiful box. It was like something very beautiful that was tangible. Um, in on the inside, it was it was a it was a CD. Um, and it had some, you know, beautiful engraving on the outside and the party was great. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually really eager to put this into some device to listen to it. And I, I get into my car and I realize, oh my gosh, I don't have the ability to listen to this CD. I didn't, my car didn't have a CD, uh, CD-ROM player. The home I was, I was, I was renting a home at that time. Didn't have a CD player. Um, you know, my laptop at that time, I just got a new laptop. Didn't have a CD-ROM, you know, compact disc reader. And I was yeah. thinking, this is, this is wild. What, how did, when did, when did this happen? You know, cause the CD, <laughs> the CD was the main platform. And I remember my, you know, when I, when I was a teenager, it was the, the cassette tape deck, mm. you know, that was, that was my pre and you would hook that into your iPod and that's what how how you would listen to the songs on your on your iPod. Anyway, I remember thinking, <laughs> okay, there's already so many barriers to to the music that I perform. You know, I'm thinking about my family members who and and neighbors who what kind of music do you play? Is this classical music or is it, you know, something else? And I was like, we I don't we don't need any more barriers than what there currently are for this genre. And so I was thinking, what is what is the next platform? You know, so it doesn't have to be, okay, maybe I'll I'll go to the library to go check out a, or I'll go use one of the computers at the university library library to, to listen to my colleagues' um, media. And and so I met with some friends um, in the Greensboro area. One, one was a, one is a videographer and um, got, had some degrees in um, uh, music performance. And, and here I was thinking, you know, I, I, I know what it is. It's, it's going to be a USB port or a U, just a USB. I mean, we're going to give out really cool USBs to everyone. And, and I remember <laughs> he was saying like, Erica, no, that's that's not it. And that's not cool. Um, <laughs> so he recruited uh, someone that works at, um, at the time, worked at Notion, which is a music um, composite, like a, a similar to Sibelius, right? Where you input mm. notation, music notation. And we recruited him to get his ideas. And he said, you know, I, what if we, 
what if there was an app, you know, that was accessible at your fingertips where if someone asked about, you know, let me see your like newest album. Let me see your video. Let me hear you play. You literally pull out your phone, you pull up the app and, and, and you see them play. You see, you see maybe the music that they're performing. You see maybe some behind the scene footage of the recording process. Maybe you hear the composer's voice. Maybe mm. you, maybe you hear, you know, other music by the composer. It, it was, it was kind of like a way of making it so accessible and, 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 and allowing, you know, the listener to be really involved in, in the music and the stuff yeah. that we find so interesting. Right. So um, this, this app moving sound is available for download. It's, it's free. You can, you can, um, donate money if you'd like, but the whole point was to make it as accessible as possible. Um, and, uh, it features three newly composed, well, at the time, newly composed works for the singing, moving, acting flutist, which is kind of who, who I feel like I am. I, I, I grew up in the playhouse. I grew up actually, I was more involved in choir activities in high school than I was in band. Um, and so much of these artistic sides of myself are still inform who I am today as a performer and as a teacher. So I wanted pieces that incorporated these parts of myself. And I also think that, you know, incorporating these parts, these artistic, um, uh, creative avenues of expression are also a great way of pushing students beyond their, you know, mm-hmm. um, level of, of comfort a lot of the time. And, and when you venture out and beyond where you're comfortable, often you get gross, you know? Uh, so, so that's kind of, a my, uh, long, I don't know if that's a, it's an elevator pitch, but uh, that's kind of <laughs> gives you an idea of, of the inspiration behind the project and, um, and a little bit about it. And it's still available for download. Go to wherever you download your apps. There's my commercial. Nice. Nice. Well, I I would love to get into now, you know, some of the other things that you've just referenced, which is the work that you're doing. And, and, you know, I'd like to back up and talk about where you came from a little bit as well. Um, Your own educational background reads as very traditional. You've Mm -hmm. got a, a great traditional classical music pedigree, right? Um, how did you develop your interest in interdisciplinary performance? You mentioned a little bit, but I, I bet you can probably elaborate. And also, are there ways in which you feel that your your education prepared you for what you're doing now? And are there are there ways maybe where um, you don't feel like you were prepared for what you're doing now? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, as I mentioned. You know, when I when I was a high schooler, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, what do I what do I do? Do I do I audition as a vocalist? Should I should I, you know, more pursue flute? Um, You know, I I hadn't really made the decision, to be quite honest, when I was a 17 or 18 year old, uh, because because I was so interested in all these different facets. And I and, and they all really informed and and. Um, kind of provided a synergistic energy in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, th- that was always there uh, throughout all the degrees. I think at times I kind of had to push aside my my singing, acting, you know, these these other these other components of who I was just to develop you know, my skills on the flute. Uh, and, and that was really necessary. And I would say, obviously, as we all know, these degrees really do a great job of developing you as a really skilled flutist, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. making sure that you um, have the supplemental skills to interpret and perform and understand um, context in, of the, you know, canonic works that we play. Um, but all the while, I was very aware of, you know, certain aspects that set me apart, uh, I, I share this story because maybe maybe I'm hoping this can resonate with with some listeners. Um, I was at a, a summer music festival. It was an orchestral and esteemed orchestral music festival. And the flutists, uh, we all met with our primary teacher for kind of a studio class. And we were sitting on the sofa and uh, our, our, our mentor, our, our teacher told us that we were going to go around and we were going to talk about uh, where, what we wanted to be doing, where we saw ourselves in five to 10 minutes and uh, five to 10 minutes, five to 10 years. I was, I was looking at your arm thinking, has it been five to 10 minutes? Are we, are we trying to make sure the lights go up? Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, five to 10 years. So, 
uh, we go around the circle. Luckily, it started at the opposite end of the circle. And people started saying kind of the same thing, which was, you know, I, I see myself as being principal flutist of insert your orchestra here. And mm -hmm. and every, everyone was, was, was saying the same thing, but of different orchestras. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. oh, gosh, there's clearly a right answer here. <laughs> because I don't <laughs> no. think I would have necessarily... Oh you know, said that if I started, I, I, as much as I, I love playing in orchestra, I think there's nothing like that repertoire. And if anyone has gotten to play in the middle of that, you know, huge organism of the orchestra and knows what it feels like to be in the center of it all of a Mahler symphony or of a Beethoven symphony or these incredible works. I mean, it's, it's, it's a privilege to, to know that experience, you know, and, and to play in a, in an ensemble that that's, you know, really um, high level. But I also really wanted to work one on one with individuals. I really wanted to have some agency and some to say what music I wanted to perform. And I really wanted to stand at the at the um, proscenium and and talk and look at the people in the audience and and talk to them directly, you know, and I and I wanted to talk about what what I liked about the music that I was playing. And I wanted to engage in dialogue and discussion. So, so, you know, that I was very aware how maybe that wasn't completely like a lot of my peers. And, and I think I set that aside and I really tried to hide it for, for a while. And it was until my master's where I was like, you know what, I'm going to pair the J.S. Bach partita, um, solo flute partita with um, uh, a dancer. And, and we're going to have a great time, you know, discussing the form of this piece and what type of movement I envisioned some of these, you know, episodes that occur within these different movements um, um, and how that would translate to, to actually physical movement. And then I was like, you know, this, this is who I am. This is, this is where I feel most alive. This is where I feel like this is my niche. I feel like I, I'm not seeing as many people in my community do this. I want to do this more. And so I kind of went with that and I nurtured that part of myself that really set me apart or that wasn't like other people that I was I was hearing um that made me feel different in a way in these music programs um so in a way yes my my degrees definitely did prepare me for what I'm doing you know currently and and I'll also admit that I think degrees that are offered in schools of music right now especially we're talking about performance degrees whether it's at the undergraduate or graduate level are need to be re-examined, you know, in terms of how, how are we preparing students for the world that awaits when they graduate. And I and and I've thought a lot about this because I get really passionate about how can we how can we best serve our students to make sure that they do feel um equipped to to um navigate the professional world. Um but so, so yeah, I think there could have been more classes where, you know, maybe there was some cross-disciplinary collaboration um, within, within um, disciplines outside of just school of music. Um, I think there could have been probably more classes and, um, you know, uh, playing music outside of the Western European um, tradition of, of music making. I think that would have really helped me. I think um, taking some finance classes, some business oriented classes would have really helped me. I think, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot I could, I could, I could generate a long list. Um, but, but ultimately I learned so much in all of these different degrees and my major flu professors really complemented each other. Um, so, so yes and no, I guess is my answer. <laughs> I should have my short answer to your question. Well, I like, I like that there's a yes. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. You talked a little bit about your solo work, um, and you've talked a little bit about uh, some of your philosophies for for students. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your chamber music um, and some of the ensembles that you're in. But if you want to tie it back to advice you would give students hoping to sort of mimic that path in their own lives, I'd, I'd be really open to hearing that. Um, but we were really interested in your work with Four Corners Ensemble and the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those organizations and maybe yeah. some of your upcoming projects? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, both of these ensembles are kind of based around somewhat loosely of the Puro Ensemble, so flute, clarinet, cello, violin, piano. 
um, Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble, also as a, a percussionist and uh, soprano bass baritone. Um, but Four Corners Ensemble, uh, some some uh, some of our events coming up. It's it's led by uh, composer um, professor uh, Shu Ying Li, and uh, she she just uh, started a new appointment at California State University in Sacramento. Um, uh, and every every year, Four Corners Ensemble hosts an Operation Opera, uh, which uh, brings together composers and vocalists to premiere chamber opera works. Where the where Four Corners is the ensemble, um, so it's it's a great way of meeting new people and you know um, cultivating you know that network for new music. Um, and then in, in May, Xu Ying uh, composed a concerto for each member in the ensemble, um, where the, the actual group is the accompaniment. So instead of an orchestra, it's this pure ensemble. And then she took these same concertos and then fully fleshed them out into um, uh, orchestral works. So we're we're going to play these concertos with the, the full orchestra version with the Chelsea Symphony in New York in May. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, and then Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble is uh, a kind of I'm, I'm one of the more recently uh, appointed members of that group. Um, and, uh, you know, this ensemble is the longest continuously running um, contemporary music ensemble in the country. And and this last summer, when I got to join them for the first time, COVID kind of pushed pushed that back by two years. Sure. Um, uh it was, it was, it's, it's really kind of interesting and, and ground breaking, um, you know, their, their approach to what, what to bring to the new music community. So Kevin No is the music director of PNME and, and w primary focus of this group is obviously to commission new works, um, uh, but it kind of has a theatrical bent to it. Hmm. Uh, so, so these the season is always one month long in Pittsburgh at the City Theater, um, and so there's four typically. You know, every week uh, showcases a, a new program. Um, but what's what's particularly unique is uh, this binaural experience that that the audience um, experiences. So binaural is. He, uh, we we use this mic. I don't know if anyone has seen this type of mic where it's it, it's it actually looks like a human face, and we move this mic around the stage. Um, in in this in in this large head mic, there's actually two audio inputs. Um, to to simulate the the human experience of you know having two ears on the either side of our head. Um, and so every member in the audience wears headphones, and they get to be immersed into this binaural experience, and it's really it's something um, in, mm. in terms of how unique this experience is. It literally feels like you are in the middle of the ensemble, um, getting a sense of spatial awareness and, and all of that. Uh, so really looking forward to this upcoming season with them uh, and in July. Awesome. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how you got connected with either of those opportunities? Or yeah. I'm always thinking of my students who are like, Absolutely. oh, that's so cool. I want to do that what would you tell them? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Great, great point. I mean, I think a lot of this is, is, um, you putting out in the world, what you love and what you're passionate about and trying to find others who are equally as passionate about similar things. And when you're putting, if that's what you're putting out into the world, you know, um, it's amazing what can come back to you. So I think a lot of this was, was through, um, uh, you know, friendships and professional networks that that were built, you know, while, while I was a student, um, you know, Four Corners Ensemble, I've been playing with them, I think, since around 2018. And, and it started off with um, kind of a Michigan, University of Michigan connection. So while I was doing my doctorate there, you know, these were also alums of University of Michigan, and we had overlapped in our doctorate. So that felt, um, that felt yeah, kind of, natural um and then pittsburgh new music ensemble that that was an audition uh so i think you know they they had reached out to several flutists and and that was kind of through an audition process mm -hmm. um and i'm sure you know whenever we're looking for chamber musicians we're looking for not only like really great players people who have clearly are masters on their instrument but we're looking for a match you know personally and 
I mean, we all know when you play in a chamber group, it's it's so much of who you are as a person comes out in those rehearsals, you know, and and it has to feel like a, a fit. So, um, I, I think my 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 advice to someone who's really interested in pursuing um, that is how are you forming those chamber groups right now? How are you learning that literature right now? How are you becoming the best flutist that you can right now? And what are you doing to nurture those, those relationships and those networks, um, whether that's in your school, but, you know, outside of your school. I mean, social media is this, I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with social media, but there's a lot to love about it in terms of how we connect with people, you know, regardless of geographic location and in terms of interests. You could be putting out, you know, what, what, like I just, how I, how I started this conversation, what music you like to play and um, what music you want to advocate for. And, and hopefully people will chime in and say, heck yeah, I like that too. Let's do something. Let's talk on a podcast, you know? So that's, that's my thought. <laughs> nice. That's, these are all such fascinating projects that you have going and so many of them too, right now. Well, probably for, for a long time now for you. You have this wildly creative, inspiring portfolio career as a contemporary performer, and yet you're also a full-time professor. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know um, if you ever feel tension between those two worlds and and how you maintain a balance during the school year. Yeah, I, I absolutely do not feel tension with that. I think whenever I can tell when the balance is off, because... I love both of these aspects of my job so much. I think one really informs the other. And 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 a lot of times I'm I'm going to be honest, these some of these creative and innovative projects are are inspired by my students. You know, that's it's thinking about okay, how can we more effectively um how can I more effectively uh uh present and uh, you know, fundamental concepts that are that are talked about in in, in flute lessons. Like, for instance, I'm I'm thinking about, you know, how how I I became really interested in commissioning for the singing, acting, moving flutist. Um, I I am an adamant believer that if we're going to find dynamic and dynamic range on on the flute, um, we first have to be able to find it within you know, with our, with our primary instrument, our anatomical, you know, instrument, uh, that, that is our body. That is our, that is our voice. Um, because if we can't find that dynamic within take the flute away, you know, how are we going to find it on a metal tube? Right. So, so often in lessons, we, we put the flute aside and our students are like, Oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> and, and we, and we have to talk, sing and, and use our, our body and our voice to find what we're trying to create with our instrument, with just air, you know? Um, so, you know, I was thinking, okay, well, we need, we need more pieces that expect this of the flutist. Um, and, and, you know, that, and I, and remember these lessons so dis, you know, distinctly in these individual students who were like, there was a spark that went off for me, like, oh my gosh, this, this could be a really cool idea. And this might, this might help the cultivation of this aspect for this part of their playing. Um, so so I see I see them very much um, overlapped and and like I men mentioned early that synergistic energy um, yes it can be really tricky during the academic year in terms of making sure you're there and you want to be on a reliable schedule for your students so that they get to see you every single week instead of like oh four lessons in a matter of a week you know I think we all remember when when we had to have multiple lessons in a week as a student and how challenging that was to make sure you had that repertoire. Um, so that can be that can be a bit of a juggling act. But I I noticed that I I am more energized and I come to lessons with a renewed um, mission and purpose and excitement when I am out there performing. And, and 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 vice versa. So I I I don't I don't see it as tension. I see it as almost um you know one supporting the other. That's really interesting. Some some people that we have talked to really do discuss how they have to kind of put things in boxes and pick up one box and and put another one 
a way and you you have a very holistic approach to everything you're doing I guess it goes back to the way you described your interests in high school too and how those were always informing each other and with you yeah and I you know and, and now that you mention it like that I, I I really do see part of me as a performer as an educator you know I see myself as a storyteller as a advocate as a you know I, I think I I feel more yet to, to go back to that p word purpose and meaning in what I do when I when I when it's more than just the flute and the music right mm-hmm. and and so I I I do I see I see I I really do see an overlap and there isn't a putting one hat on and and taking it off right you mentioned earlier um you you said something something like you know growth growth can come from challenge or, or there is yeah. great growth and challenge. Right. Uh, and I think this is, I mean, this is largely what we are trying to affect and what we are trying to shepherd our students through every week in lessons. Yeah. Are you, do you experience, how do you experience those um, moments when students push back? If you, if you have of them at all when students say like this is too much it's too hard are you are you noticing trends are you are you having more difficulties with that now than you used to Mm. I mean uh, I don't know about now I I see I think that's been a constant maybe maybe that's Mm -hmm. been a little bit more I I don't I to be honest I haven't seen that trend but I I really do see a lot of and you you kind of mentioned this and maybe I'll just rephrase it um, a, a huge part of the job as a teacher, as a mentor, as a flute professor, I guess, you know, is poking holes in these limiting narratives that students tell themselves. And I, I was, I still, you know, I don't think at, at any point in life, you, you stop, you know, creating those narratives of like, oh, I, I don't have time to learn that piece, even though it looks really great. And I really want to dig into it. But I, I hear that a lot from my students of, no, 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 no. That piece is way, way too hard for me. I, I can't learn that. And and it's it's like, what, what, why, why are you saying that? And, and <laughs> is that is that really for you to decide? And it, you know, and and why not? Can we can we try? You know, let's 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 take it one measure at a time. Is this single note feel too challenging? No, let's add on two notes. No, let's add on two measures. You know, or or oh, I don't I po- don't have po- I don't have time to to schedule that non-degree recital. And it's like, well. Well, let's look at your priorities. You know, can we, is there a way that we can do a half recital? And I think it's really, it's, it's helpful to have someone who questions those, you know, and, and I guess the, the better word is challenge, you know, those, those limiting things that, that, that voice that we all have, that's always there saying, no, you're not good. enough. No, there's enough time. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and you know what, when you're a student, that's exactly when you should be doing it, right? Because the whole right. structure is there to be set up to for to land in a soft place, you know? And mm-hmm. the the resources are there, the 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 musicians are there, the the, the performance spaces, the you know, the support is there. Um so I I really encourage people to notice first of all when they're telling themselves no I can't possibly do that and is that born out of like reality or is that a, a defense mechanism or is that because you're consciously putting priority somewhere else which is legitimate you know sometimes you you need to be you know protective of your time and and not saying that you need to say yes to everything but in it, at a certain extent when you're a student I really do suggest you say yes and and try it on for size because it becomes harder to 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 say yes you know once once you're once you've graduated and and you're juggling a lot of different things that maybe you weren't juggling <laughs> as a student right <laughs> erica i think the first time i interacted with you um, was an email that you sent me and I, several other, I think we were all flutists, you know, working in academia. You were doing some committee work there at UNCG and you were reaching out to us to ask us about how our music departments were trying to diversify repertoire, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly, yeah. and performances. Um, and, and in that email, 
I also noticed, I don't remember what year it was, but I remember yours was one of the first email signatures that I had ever seen with pronouns listed. Mm. We're all doing it now, but yours was the first I had seen. And you had a link underneath those pronouns saying why this matters and a link to a short article explaining why we should all be sharing our pronouns. So I will, I, I, I always associate you with this sort of hypersensitivity and awareness that there, there are a multitude of perspectives and experiences out there and that you are really trying in, in word and deed to be extremely inclusive, that which I really you. appreciate about you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You're also living in North Carolina, a state which has become part of, I think, ground zero for the dismantling of affirmative action. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about how this, you know, this very recent overturning of affirmative action will um, affect your students, affect your school, and maybe even affect affect all of us in classical music. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you bringing this question uh, up. I think we should be talking about these things more, um, even though they can be very challenging to talk about. Uh, but, but one thing I do know is that growth and change occurs through conversation um, and discussion and, and learning and listening. Um, so, Right. Uh, Supreme Court is, is hearing um, these affirmative action uh, related uh, um, cases. Uh, one is Harvard um, related to Harvard and one is related to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Supreme Court has not yet, you know, struck down affirmative action. Uh, but but, you know, I, I to. I guess I'll, I'll begin by by sharing that, yes, if affirmative action is um, banned or, you know, overturned, and, and to be clear, that's that's already the case in, in many states, uh, you know, California, Florida, Oklahoma, Michigan, New Hampshire, um, to, name, to name a few, um, that will change, uh, you know, our institutions and our classrooms and our communities. We know there is data. And, and I was listening to a podcast that was produced by the New York Times um, that referenced this study. It was a study that was done in 19 different uh, public funded universities in states where uh, affirmative action was was banned and and it affected uh, you know historically underrepresented populations and their enrollment uh, uh, first year enrollment in college they were looking at what you know the the graduating high school um, student demographic and how that compared to uh, enrollment that fall for a college freshman so we know that that it will, um, change, uh, change our, our, our classrooms. Like I mentioned, our classrooms, our communities are, you know, on a small level and on a larger level. I can tell you UNCG is, is a minority serving institution with an undergraduate population of 49% ethnic minority students in 67. I I'm hoping I'm getting that, that precise number correct. Um, female students, and, and it's part of what I love about where I work. You know, many of our students are first generation and they come to us with a rich, varied musical background and that benefits everyone. Um, so, you know, I, I think as musicians, this, this concept, this, this topic is really important um, because we can do a lot. I mean, affirmative action is is one prong in a multi prong um, ways that we can uh, ensure diversity in all of its forms um, uh, in in higher education. Right? What are some other ways that we can do that? Um, is making sure that we are investing and advocating for uh, equitable access to K through twelve education. Right? Mm -hmm. um, making sure that um, access to pre-K is is available for all. We can advocate for parental leave. We know that all of these things are also a way of uh, making sure there's um, uh, 
you know, an, a, a way of making sure everyone access has access if they want to to pursue higher education. Um, and and as musicians, we can do that, right? We can do that in a variety of ways. Whether that is advocating, you know, for funding for for these programs that I just mentioned, whether that's going to these programs and asking, how can I be of support to you? How can I, you know, so many of these music programs have been, oh my gosh, what COVID did to a lot of music programs is 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 sad, and um and and you know, there are a lot of people. You know, because they weren't they didn't they weren't able to play next to their friends because it was such a highly aerosol producing instrument. Uh, you know, there was a numbers decreased. Um, so how can we how can we generate more excitement in making sure education and private private instruction is a little bit more accessible for everyone? Um, uh, no, I think this also gets into you know the the music that music that is programmed, music that is learned, music that is talked about, music that is studied, you know, has, it has meaning and it has power. And, and students, we need to be engaged with students actively in lessons on a, on a weekly basis of discussing, you know, let's talk about this piece of music and let's, let's think about how we can really thoughtfully craft a program. Can we, let's, let's look at these composers and let's look at their identities. And, and if there's a piece from the canon, how can we, let's, let's, let's actively talk about why this person and why this piece entered the canon, why maybe um, a contemporary did not. Um, and, you know, I think these are all act actively, we can, we can be, um, change makers and, uh, and leaders, um, to make sure that our, our programs, our schools of music, our, our recital programs, our communities are, a little bit more equitable and uh, more ref reflective of, of a lot of different ways of making music and, you know, differing cultures and differing backgrounds than, you know, the, the, the traditional Western European um, uh, approach in, in music and composers that, that we, we, we typically see. Yeah. Um, you, uh, this is a question I always like to ask, and I feel like you've given some answers to this already, but I'll ask it in case there's even more we could add. Um, what professional advice do you give your students and how, sometimes I wish I had a crystal ball so I could look into the future and say, oh, this is what I'm preparing my students for. But of course we don't yeah, have that. Yeah. Uh, but it does feel like the the landscape is really changing rapidly at this point. So how do you think your students will be able to distinguish themselves and and make a living or or call themselves successful musicians when they graduate. Yeah, I I I guess maybe there's a a variety of ways of answering that. I mean, there's more of a generalized advice that I would I would give, which is um I guess a, a couple points are coming to mind. First is uh, there's there's so much meaning and symbol symbolic meaning in asking questions, hmm. and I wish this has always been a dream of you know, next semester, maybe we'll do it uh, where we start every lesson and every studio class with with just going around the room asking questions. Um, whether that's, it, and I'll go into why I think this is really meaningful. First of all, it admits that you don't know everything. <laughs> and, and sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. It is a bid for connection with another person, right? Um, it is a path for creating and cultivating empathy, getting to know another person's perspective. It is a way of actively thinking and questioning the status quo, right? It is a way of engaging in critical thought and being creative. If you're asking, what if flute lessons in a music program were 
not just taught by the flute professor. What if they were taught by the clarinet professor and the steel pan ensemble director and the wind ensemble conductor and the, you know, the old the old time music ensemble director that plays the banjo and the fiddle, right? I mean, just the act of putting that out there and then thinking, oh, wow, well, what about that, right? And I think that's also a great way of understanding more about yourself. How would I answer that? Uh, what, what about my response makes me unique and different from the person that's sitting next to me? And then I think that's point number two, understand what makes you different and maybe sets you apart within your, whatever community you find yourself in. And we all kind of exist in these concentric circles of communities, right? right. And nurture that and figure out how can I how can I make sure that I am nurturing this and, and sharing it with the world? Um, <clears throat> I guess another point, and maybe this is, and this is kind of reinforcing the question part. Go, go, go find someone who is, you can envision yourself doing what they're doing. And maybe maybe that's something totally unconventional or maybe that's something really traditional. You know, find that person that's like, "Oh, I I could I kind of I kind of want to do that. I like this aspect of their day. I can kind of see how I would be good at that." And take them out for coffee and pick their brain. Figure out how did how did they get there? What what were some setbacks? How did they get beyond the setback? Did what what advice do they have for you to get to what they're doing, right? And then maybe always ask what who who do you know that I can who are some other people that I can talk to about doing this, right? And this goes back to something earlier in the conversation, which is so many professional opportunities happen through your network. And, and I'm sure this isn't the first time whoever is listening to this has heard that. And, and it maybe is cliche, but it is worth saying over and over and over again. And work on your social skills, because that is actively a part of, of cultivating that, that network. Um, so, you know, you can, you can be a freshman or a sophomore or a first year master student, or even someone who is not in school and thinking about, well, maybe I want to go back for my doctorate or you know, maybe I just, I want to figure out how to play my flute more um, and and thinking and actively, you know, preparing for that. Okay, how can how can I prepare for doing that in, in, in a couple of years? Well, I can start asking people who are doing that. How did they get there? Um, do you have advice for me? Who else can I talk to? And then, you know, um, yeah, I'm going to underscore something else that I mentioned earlier in this in this conversation, which was put out into the world what it is you want to be doing. Um, yeah. Those are all really great answers. I like all of those. Um, we usually like to wrap things by asking our guests Um to name three pieces that they are either listening to or are feeling very inspired by right now. So Erica, yes. what are your three? You know, when I, when I read that, um, maybe you'd ask, ask this, I will admit that immediately the, I'll, I'll tell you what my first three things, um, were. And then I, and then I, and then I reflected on these three things and thought, well, maybe they didn't mean that. <laughs> okay. The first <laughs> thing is a piece by Derek Skye. Um, which is um, uh, actually an orchestral piece, prisms, leaps, and cycles. It, those three words, maybe I got them out of order. And I've, I, I'm notorious for doing this, where I listen to something on repeat for weeks on end. And this piece is just fascinating, and it's exhilarating in terms of its rhythmic complexities and its textures. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, the second one, to be honest, I, I, I'm singing and I'm surrounded by a lot of nursery rhyme songs. And I'm really inspired by how much a young person 
and an old person, older person, can learn through the singing of wheels on the bus and head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and the five <laughs> monkeys jumping on the bed, and you know, Polly put the kettle on, and I could go down the list because you know I'm actively. This is this is a lot of how yeah. I'm 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 interacting with music right now. My son is 16 months. And to see how he engages with these songs and how he learns the gestures and how he himself, you know, is kind of singing along is just fascinating. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, my holiday playlist. I'm a sucker for holiday music. And my number one album that I listen to is Leslie Odom, Odom Jr. because his voice is just phenomenal. So as I was coming up with these three things, realizing <laughs> this is what I'm listening to, I was like, oh, maybe they were referring to flute repertoire <laughs> no we no. weren't oh you weren't okay no literally anything that you're listening to in the moment i love nice. that your list is very authentic to where you are right now yes it is <laughs> it is so then then I'll, I'll i'll leave it at that but i do want to put in a plug for Derek sky he wrote um commissioned by ben smolin wrote a phenomenal flute work uh for flute and piano and uh and uh, someone who also um, sings and claps their hands and does kind of body percussion uh, entitled Grace Unbound um, that I, I, every time I listen to this and listen to Ben's recording, there's a YouTube video where Derek is actually dancing. Um, it, it just, it lights a fire for me. And um, so that's on my, on my wish list. That's the next thing I really want to learn and perform. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Erica, you make me feel, you make me feel optimistic. Mm. Well, that, that means a lot because, you know, that's, that's kind of, I feel like, well, gosh, we need more of things. Mm -hmm. We you do. know, coming back from, you know, this was the, this was my first semester back into academia. I, 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 right. I took a research leave and I had a parental leave and, and things feel different. There's a different energy that I'm noticing. You know, I feel like, um, there, you know, in fall of 2020, people had this verve of like, let's let, we, we can create change. Let's let's make some big moves. And now I, I'm noticing there's just kind of this, wow, there's certain things that are still we're still having to deal with, you know, on an international level. And there's it's 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 a dynamic time right now. And I think there's just a lot of exhaustion. So if I could provide a little optimism, that means a lot. And um, <laughs> and I and I have to admit, you know, these types of initiatives and what you guys are doing and, you know, creating creating a space for conversation that provides optimism. And I'm hoping that maybe there was a kernel of optimism in there for, for someone else who was listening. So maybe that's my goal. Let's, let's spread optimism, optimism and good energy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident that there is that kernel. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Erica. It's really been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. really. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is fun. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Music Crush. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also support the podcast, read show notes, and learn more about FNMC by visiting www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com. <laughs>